How are we doing? Doing okay? Good. Thank you. Hey, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Dana. <laughs> I've got one. Patrick, happy Father's Day, guys. Hey, uh, Dennis, happy Father's Day, brother. Scott. Yep, yep, Jim. Okay, good. Hey, uh, we're so happy you're here, especially you dads. I was reading a little bit this week. Uh, this spiritual influence that fathers have on kids is, is just so incredibly important. So fathers, dads who are here, uh, man, you matter so much. Uh, just so, so much to your children, to the next generation. I'm thankful for you. And for those that Father's Day is hard, which just like Mother's Day, uh, it brings a lot of sometimes pain, discouragement, uh, feelings of failure, feelings of loss, uh, you're thought of, and we love you. And, and yeah, we, we miss our dads, don't we? So, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up and we're going to do our usual uh, call to worship. It's, it's a responsive reading once again. So I'll do the part of the leader, church, and I'd invite you to uh, say the part of the people. This is from Psalm 68. These are the words of the Lord. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the desert. His name is the Lord. Exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Blessed be the Lord. Who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are father to the fatherless. You're the protector of widows. Thank you that we have you as our perfect heavenly father this morning. What a gift it is, Father, to know you. And to see you. And to know your loving care for us. To know your gentle correction and discipline. Uh, to be loved by you. It is the greatest thing that we could ever know. <clears throat> Father, I pray for any of those that are here this morning that are struggling, that are hurting, that are not able to see your love for them, Lord, that this morning you would open their eyes to know that they have a Heavenly Father who loves them dearly. And you're worthy of that praise. We see it most clearly in Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And so this morning, we want to sing to you because you are worthy. Your love is true. It's wholehearted. It doesn't hold back. And so this morning, help our hearts to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. to greet one another around you and come on back when you hear the music. Huh? 
for you a seat and children there is Sunday school but just hang tight for a minute okay happy Father's Day to my brothers out there Thank you. we haven't done this in a long time so we, we're gonna bring back a little tradition of honoring a couple of fathers in the church so I got to pick the categories so first category and this applies to people that are in the actual church so fathers with the most kids, let's start at five. Stand up. All right, four. Yes. That are actually in the church. Yes. Yes? Ooh, this is tough. So I can only pick one. Stronger one. <laughs> no, I got something special for him. Who's got the oldest out of you, Dave, you and Nick? Dave. Dave? Right. You're the man. Give it up hey, Tristan. Come here for a minute, Tristan. So Dave, here's a Snicker bar, because you're nuts for having so many kids, and some cards to work with the kids. Tristan, come on up here for a minute. Which father has the most girls? Special one for you. Here's a 100K bar, because that's how much money you're going to need to put them through college and weddings. The oldest father, let's start at 75. What? 73. Two? One? Who is the oldest father in the church? That has anybody with kids here? How old are you, Dennis? Bob? 74. I got two 74s. You guys can fight it out later. So, for you, Dennis, Tom, I'll hook you up later. I got you a whatchamacallit because you're going to forget, and a bookmarker for your books. Don't bring that to Dennis, would you? And this one is on the Honor Society. Who's the most clumsy? Who's had an accident in the last month? Anything. Hit your, stub your toe, hit your hand. Last two months, <laughs> three months, nobody? All right, so pick somebody, Tristan. Who do you think is the most clumsy in here out of all the fathers? <laughs> Bob, yeah, let's honor Bob anyway. So Bob, here's a Butterfinger for you and a book for you to read for the next 40 days. <laughs> all the other fathers, I have a little something for everybody, so at the end of the service when you go out, I'll have a couple of the ushers hook you up, all right? God bless you all. All right, I get the privilege now of saying congratulations, kiddos. You've graduated whatever grade you're in. On the count of three, tell me what grade you're going into. One, two, three. Wow, amazing, congratulations. A fruit of the spirit is faithfulness, and you've shown faithfulness. So we're really proud of you, congratulations. And we wanna honor three young men in particular who have been faithful for 12 years and are graduating high school. So Dean, Luke, and Gabe, why don't you guys come up here, please? Give them a hand. Come on. Yes, gentlemen, uh, first off, we're really proud of you. Uh, you guys have persevered, and we're going to miss you a lot. Luke, we know you're sticking around. We're very thankful for that. Uh, Dean and, and Gabe, we know that you both are going to college. Dean, you're going to Quinnipiac. Did I say that right? Gabe, N-J-I-T. Okay. Man, hey, so I don't have cool gifts like candy bars, but I do have the Word of God that I would love to give you. Uh, we, we've, as a church, we engraved your names on these. Uh, there, there's no greater gift that we could honestly give you than the Word of God. And so we want you to be men that live in this book. Uh, it, it also could double as a door jam pretty well. But please, don't, don't, don't have this 
serve you as a door jam while you go to college or you, you go off to work, uh, we want to just pray for you. We're thankful for you. We're proud of you. Uh, and we're excited for this next season of your life, okay? So, hey, congregation, if you'd uh, pray with me, and if you just want to extend a hand as a sign of uh, blessing upon them, we're going to pray. So, Father God, we thank you for these three young men. Lord, the, the, the gift that they've been to our church. Father, they've persevered, they've endured, they've worked hard, and they've been faithful. And we just see Jesus in them, in that, because he is faithful. Lord, in this next season of their life, as they, they move on and they, they grow and they learn more and they, and they become men in society, Father, we pray that, Jesus, you would rule and reign in their hearts. That they would take after uh, their heavenly Father and follow him hard. Bless them, Lord. Give them diligence in, in their studies. Give Luke diligence as he pursues what God has for him next. Watch over them, Father, and use them to make an impact in this culture, Lord, that needs you, uh, that they desperately need to see young men that are sold out for you, Father. We thank you for these, these guys. We pray a blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to go ahead and dismiss the uh, little ones for Sunday school at this time. At this time, I'm going to invite our ushers forward for our offering. And as they prepare to come forward, uh, just a quick reminder, um, we have always been, and I, and I really appreciate that this is a no pressure giving community of believers, and so don't feel any pressure to give. Um, Jesus wants us to be cheerful givers, and that's all. So if you find it in your heart to give something back to the church, to the Lord, that we could use to further the work here, um, we praise you, we, we thank you, correction, we thank you, and we praise the Father for it. So, let's pray for our offering. Our Lord God, uh, thank you for this opportunity, this time to, to serve you uh, collectively as a body um, and through giving, Lord. Um, it is a direct way that we can serve you and, and, and bless this community of, of believers um, and forward your work, Lord. Um, thank you that we get to be an opportunity um, to to share in that and to, um, to directly uh, be a part of your work, Lord, to directly be used by you. Uh, thank you, Father, that, um, that you've touched us enough to want to give, um, Lord. You, every good gift comes from you, Lord, so, so thank you, Father, for how you have worked in our lives to, um, to bring us together as your saints, Lord. So we praise you and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So I have a few quick announcements. I promise I'll be brief. They took up all of the cool announcements. I get the everyday boring stuff. Anyway, uh, so I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, we, are, we are officially entering into our, our summer schedule. And so some of our regularly occurring um, Bible studies uh, meetings and such are going to be um, on a different schedule. So just be mindful of that. If you do attend any of those services, um, or if you don't and you have been thinking about it, um, just be considerate of that as you uh, make your planning. Reach out to those that are leading those. Um, and, and then I have two quick announcements. These are m more um, the more meteor ones, um, specifically the special congregational meeting that we are having on July 16th, that is a Sunday. We're gonna have a special members meeting directly after church. Uh, we do need a quorum for that as we will be um, voting on a couple of important things. So please make a point to add that to your plan of events. And lastly, certainly not least, um, VBS is gonna be July 31st through August 3rd. That is going to be uh, 9.30 a.m. to 12. Um, so 
bring the little ones, encourage the children, grandchildren to come through. Uh, they will be uh, spending a lot of quality time. I know Kim is spearheading that, and so I'm sure, I am certain that they're going to be learning some very, very wholesome stuff. That's 9.30 to 12, and if you are willing and able to or interested in volunteering, Kim Lee is the point of contact for that. Um, I'm sure it will be more than welcome. That is all. At this time, I'm going to read our scripture reading for the day, which is in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through the end of the chapter. I believe that's 56. I'm going to be reading from the ESV. It should be behind me on the screen if you'd like to follow along. I would encourage you to do so. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As, she went, as Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him, except Peter and John and James, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Amen. Thanks, Ray. Well, good morning. This may feel like a... Uh, you ever been in a car where you have to jerk the car real hard uh, to get to, to swerve a little bit? We're about to do that because we, we've had some laughs and now we're going to talk about some hard stuff, okay? You ready? Let's take a breath. I was, uh, this past week I was talking to some dear friends of mine and they were sharing with me how they're really suffering. Uh, they've been suffering for a while. Uh, and as we talked, they said something very honest and very illuminating about this study that we've been in, about the power of Jesus, right? Because that's what we've been looking at. It's the power of Jesus over disaster, over demons, and in this text, over disease and even death itself. And they said essentially this. They said, Pastor, it isn't the question of whether or not God has the power to intervene in our situation. We, we know. We know he has the power. The question I have is why isn't he doing it? Right? Why isn't he doing it, Pastor? Why isn't he intervening? And that's, that's the rub. That, that's, that's the rub of the question. Why isn't he doing it? Right? We all know Jesus has the power to calm storms, to, to cast out the things that control us. He even has the power over disease and death. I'd say even if you aren't a believer here this morning, you're, you're just checking out church and Jesus and, and this whole faith thing, that you would agree that if God were real, certainly he would be all powerful, wouldn't he? Right? Because he created everything. But that's not the issue. The lingering doubts, 
The difficulties that we come up with is the fact that God can rescue us from destruction, demons, disease, and death. Yet, we sometimes wonder why does he seem so unwilling to do anything? If we're being really honest. And something I know is that these accounts, that, like the ones we just read, right, where, where a young girl has her life literally given back to her, and a woman who's suffered for 12 years is immediately healed, they often don't help us as we're struggling. They often provoke more pain, if we're honest. What I'm saying is that these miracles can often fuel unbelief rather than promote belief. How could that be? Well, it's, it's pretty clear, right? Jesus has all power on heaven and on earth. And I need a miracle. He literally doesn't have to lift a finger to help me, but nothing's happening. Why? Why Jesus? Are you surprised that the Word of God can often lead us to struggle and doubt God? Does that surprise you? Maybe you think I'm a little crazy for saying that. But it shouldn't surprise us, church, because we have a very real enemy. And the Bible calls him a liar. And the only power, Christian, that he has over you is to deceive you. And the greatest weapon of deception that he's going to use over you is the very word of God. It's what he's been doing from the beginning. He distorts the word of God for your destruction. He takes what the Bible calls the sword of the Spirit, which is supposed to cut in order to heal. And he turns it into a jagged knife to cut you and hopefully destroy you. That's what he does. He wants to distort the truth of this word in the hopes that you might abandon the way and the truth and the life. That's what he wants. So don't be surprised that the Bible itself could lead you to struggle. But God's not left you alone. He's not left us alone. Right? The Bible tells us that he's given us a helper by the name of the Holy Spirit. And we have this helper and we have the word of God itself. And so this morning, what I want us to do is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. We're going to wage spiritual war. We're going to destroy strongholds and every lofty opinion that's raised against the true knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's what we're going to do. And to do this, we're going to dismantle what I see as the two most significant strongholds that come off the heels of that question that we posed. I need a miracle. Jesus doesn't even have to lift a finger to do it, but I'm not seeing him do anything. And the first stronghold goes something like this. I must not be the type of person Jesus uses his power to help. It's me. I'm the problem. And our text this morning goes out of its way to say that's not true. That's not true. In this whole book of the Bible, the Gospel of Luke, our sermon series for this whole thing is Jesus' salvation is for all people. All people. And this text shows it. Look at these two individuals, right? This is, this is what I call a miracle sandwich. I don't know where I got that from, but it's a miracle sandwich. Raising of the dead, right? And in the middle is the woman that's healed. Why did Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, make it like this? Well, it's because he wants us in part to compare and contrast these two people coming to Jesus for help. Now look at it. Jairus is a man. The unnamed woman is a woman. 
Fascinating, right? <laughs> You're like, yes, I know that, Pastor. Well, you know also then in that day that to be a man and a woman in that culture and in that society was extremely different in its experience. So, for example, women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Men were. Which, side note, makes it all the more likely that the resurrection of Jesus is true because who were the first witnesses? Women. So it would be pointless for them to have women as the first witnesses unless it really was what happened. But so anyway, the experience of men and women is completely different. Jairus, though, isn't a normal man, is he? What does the text say? It says that he's the ruler of a synagogue. What does that mean? It means he's culturally respected. He's a man of importance. He's a man that people would look up to. He would be a man of high status. Likely, he's financially comfortable. Maybe even well-to-do. And he's understood by nature of his role to be close to God. So that's Jairus. Now we have an unnamed woman. What we know about her is for 3,000... 4,380 straight days, she's had a flow of blood. She's suffered. And that flow of blood has kept her marginalized in society. She's been ostracized and cast out because she is ceremonially unclean. She, she cannot be around people. She's supposed to be separate. She can't go to synagogue. She's supposed to keep away from people. So she... Unlike Jairus is not looked up to, she's looked down upon. While he's a man of high status, she has the lowest status in society. While he's financially comfortable, what does the text say? She's financially impoverished because she's used all of her money trying to find a cure. And she's understood not to be close to God, but to be far from God. Because Look at her. She's suffering. and God hasn't healed her. Do you see the point that Luke is making? Jesus doesn't have a certain type of person that his power is for. These two people are polar opposites. But yet they're both beneficiaries of Jesus' powerful work. But you may be thinking, that's awesome. That's great. But clearly... There are some haves and some have-nots, right? They have Jesus' miracles, his power, and then there are those that don't have it, right? Not everybody got healed. Not everybody got their daughter back. And you may be literally sitting in this church feeling that way this morning. Yeah, I know those people, their parent, their father, they beat cancer. What about me? My dad didn't beat cancer. Right? They're the haves, I'm the have-not. What about those people? They have the, the, the depth of relationship that I really need, and I don't. I, don't. I don't have a community. They get the finances and the resources that they want to take a rest and vacation. I just have to keep working. And I ask God to help me with this, but I don't get any rest. Maybe some of you feel that way. And you might be thinking, it's, maybe it's because, right, there's something deficient in me. Maybe Satan's telling you that this morning. What are some ways that we blame ourselves or we think that God is holding out on us? Let me give you four from this text. I've been asking God for a miracle. I'm not getting it. Maybe it's because my fears are precluding my faith. My fears, right? Right? I'm in the midst of a debilitating situation. And rather than letting faith take over, if I'm really honest with myself, fear is having its way in my life. I know that faith is supposed to rule over my fears. And Jesus even says it to this guy in verse 50, doesn't he? Don't fear. Just believe. And she will be well. And you're just realizing, I'm not strong enough. I'm literally freaking out right now. Fear is having its way with me. Well, 
our family was hanging out with the Waltz the other night, uh, and all the kids were huddled around Mr. Ron. And if you don't know, Mr. Ron is a detective for Englewood Cliffs, and they were watching these awesome videos of being a police officer. And, and at some point, uh, I, I overheard uh, Mr. Ron say to the kids, hey kids, courage is not the absence of fear. That's not what courage is. No, courage is the willingness to move forward into your fears and despite them, right? That's what true courage is. And I think Jesus would say the same thing about faith, right? Jesus would say, faith isn't the absence of fears, Christian. Faith is the willingness to step forward with Jesus in the midst of those fears that are swirling around you. Right? It's stepping into that room where your most fearful nightmare has happened. But it's going in that room with Jesus. That's what it means to have faith. Your fears don't preclude you from having faith. Okay, you think. But if it's not my fear, it's probably my weak faith. Because, man, my faith is weak. To which the scriptures would say, yes. Faith is the means by which we receive the saving power of Jesus. It's the means, Christians, that we receive it. But Jesus never said that the strength of your faith is what is contingent upon that it's all about the strength of Jesus' faithfulness. Right? Remember, your faith can be as small as a mustard seed. But Jesus' faithfulness can move mountains. Think of it this way. We, we've hiked along the trails over the Hudson. I don't know if y'all have. But think you're hiking along there and, and you're at one of the, air, the points where it's like 200 feet above the water. And the trail is taking you very close to the edge. And you're getting a little nervous. And you, you look down and you realize, if I slip, I'm done for. I, I'm, I'm toast. And all of a sudden, underneath your feet, the ground gives way and you start to fall. But then all of a sudden, you jerk to a stop. And you realize your backpack and the little hook on top got caught by a branch and you're dangling 200 feet in the air. I have a question for you. Does the strength or weakness of your faith in that branch matter to whether that branch is going to hold you up? It has no bearing on whether that branch is going to save your life or not. What matters is the strength of that tree root in that moment. And let me tell you, Jesus is no puny branch. He's the branch of David. He's the root of Jesse. He's not going to let you fall. It's not based upon your faith, Christian. It's based upon his faithfulness. Okay, well if it's not my fear and it's not my faith, it must be because my situation doesn't merit Jesus' intervention. Right? I, I know some of y'all, you're like, I can't share anything with anybody because it just doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal. Right? We tell ourselves this all the time. My situation doesn't merit concern. Which is a form of pride, by the way. Uh, it does merit our concern, and we want you to know that. But for the sake of this, I want you to see Jesus is on his way to heal a 12-year-old girl. She's on the cusp of starting her life. At 12, at 13, she's probably going to be betrothed to be married. She's got her whole life ahead of her. It's a very significant time in her life, and she's about to die. But look at what Jesus does. There's this woman, and she has this bleed, and his power heals her. And you know what he does? He doesn't say, all right, I got to keep going. I got to go save that girl. No, he says, I'm going to stop. This woman is important to me. 
she needs to know that she's completely healed. Right? She, I'm not going to let her hide in anonymity any longer. I'm going to call her out so that she knows you've been set free by your faith. And in the midst of that, that little girl dies. Don't you see that Jesus is God and that he doesn't, he can't overfill his calendar like we can. Therefore, anything that you're going through is top of his priority list. He's not stretched too thin to the margins. He doesn't have margins. So what you're going through, Christian, matters deeply to him. Well, okay, I'm running out of excuses now. It's not my fear. It's not my faith. It's not my situation. It must be because I haven't earned Jesus' miraculous power. I mean, let's be honest. When's the last time I read my Bible? When's the last time I actually prayed? I haven't been very faithful going to church. And when I go, I definitely don't give and I don't serve. That must be it. I haven't done enough. I haven't merited Jesus' intervention. I knew it. To which, the scriptures say, not a single one of those kept them from Jesus. No, what brought them to Jesus? What did they bring to him? What did they merit? Humble desperation. Humble desperation. That's all these two suffering sinners had, was humble desperation. And you say, well, wait a minute. I've come to Jesus again and again and again and again in humble desperation. I've literally reached out and sought to touch the edge of his garment, but I've been rebuffed. My prayers didn't go answered. I've stepped forward by faith into the room of my greatest fears and death continued to hold its grip on the people I love. So, if it's not me, if it's not that I'm the type of person that Jesus doesn't give his power to, it must be that he's not the type of savior who uses his power for me. You know, He's got this power, but I'm experiencing none of it. And now that I think about it, Pastor, I know you've promised me his presence, but I don't feel anything. And I know you promised me that he has good purposes for my suffering too, but I don't see any of them. I have no power. I have no presence. I have no purposes. Therefore... I think this thing's pointless. This whole thing. Jesus hasn't kept up his end of the bargain. He's not trustworthy. He's either a figment of our imagination to provide meaning in a meaningless world, or he's actually just not good. And I can't tell you which is worse. Either way, though, how could I follow someone like that? Have you been there? Maybe that's you this morning. I'm, that was me before I came to faith. I've, I've talked to you guys about this. I just want you to know if, if that's you this morning, I'm sorry. Like truly, that is a painful, hard, difficult, lonely place to be. And we love you. And if you ever want to talk about it, that's what we're here for. And not us talk at you, but you talk to us, and, and we just listen. But because I have to finish this sermon, I do want to give you what I hope is, is some hope. If you get there, if you are there, where's the hope? Well, look at the last verse in our text. Her parents obviously are rightly amazed. <laughs> They've got their precious little girl back. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Why do you think Jesus did that? It's a very bizarre thing for him to say. Don't tell anyone. It's just for, for you to know. Just for my three disciples to know. My thoughts? 
it was never supposed to be just about the miracles. The miracles themselves were never the point. Yes, they served a purpose. You remember what the purpose was? They bore witness to the kingdom of God in this man, Jesus. They bore witness to the fact that he was Israel's Messiah that had been promised in the prophet Isaiah. Remember John the Baptist, the greatest above of all men, Jesus says. He's in prison and he's doubting. And what does Jesus tell him? He says, go tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. Blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Translation, I'm the Messiah. My miracles are a pointer. They lend validation to the message that Jesus brings and his claims, but they were never, ever, ever the point. But Jesus knew the temptation of making miracles the point. He knew it. That's what's happening in this text, isn't it? Look at the language. The crowds are so large, they're so desperate, that it says that they're literally suffocating him and his disciples. They're just pressing in upon them. They're desperate. And humanity has not changed in 2,000 years. He knew me and you would be pulled into the same temptation that we would make miracles the point rather than a pointer. That we'd be willing to turn towards Jesus so long as the miracles keep coming. That's what the parables of the soil is all about. Remember, Dave preached on the parable of the soils a couple weeks ago. And there, there are two in particular that I want you to think about. The first is the second type of soil. It's a type of soil where the word of God gets preached and it finds fertile soil. And faith, it springs up really fast out of joy. You know, it says something like, man, since I've started going to church, since I've started reading my Bible, life is getting good. This is awesome. Everybody should be a Christian. But then in a time of testing, when things start going sideways and south, what happens? They fall away. You see it? And Jesus knew the greatest time of testing and the most ferocious point of the enemy's attacks is this situation right here. Jesus has all power but he's not doing anything for me. He knew that we would make his miracles the litmus test of his love for us. Right? And he knew that Satan would be more than happy to say, yep, you see it? You see it? He doesn't love you. So he tells this group of people, don't tell anyone what has happened. Because the miracles were never ever, ever supposed to be the litmus test of his love for you. No, there was a greater litmus test of love. There was a greater miracle to come. In a, in a few months, he was going to make a turn. And he was going to turn out of Galilee and he was going to begin going south to Jerusalem. And he was going to go up on a mountain. And he was going to perform his greatest miracle of all. He was going to turn a Roman cross, a device of torture, into a royal throne. He was going to be enthroned on that cross. That is the greatest miracle he could ever do. He would defeat evil by taking our evil upon himself. He would do the miracle of being just, right? The miracle of not overlooking our sin. He's, he's not overlooking your sin this morning. He sees it. He is just. There will be a recompense for our sin. But on the cross, he was both the just and the justifier. Meaning that because he punished sin into himself, 
He could count you righteous and still be a good God. It's miraculous. It was the miracle of giving up his life so that we could have eternal life with him. The cross of Christ is the greatest miracle ever. This is why Paul, in Romans 8, we just got to read it. We, to, we should read it every day. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and you should say, if God is for me, can you say that this morning? If God is for me, who can be against me? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he also not with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No. No. In all of those things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither life nor death, rulers nor angels, things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, nothing in all of creation, Christian, can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Do you hear what that says? <laughs> Tribulations. Your kid gets cancer. You go bankrupt. You lose your spouse. You lose your health not separated from the love of God that is in Christ. Distress. You're constantly so anxious that you have to call 911 because you think you're having a heart attack and get rushed to the hospital. Your depression is so deep that you literally can't get out of bed. Your loneliness is so dark that it feels like it's suffocating you. Should all those things remain not separated? from the love of God in Christ. Persecution. You lose your job because you will not follow the course of this world. You lose your friends. You're marginalized at school. You go off to college, young men, and you walk in holiness. You walk in faithfulness and no one wants to hang out with you. You're a Christian in the Middle East or Asia who's been beaten nearly to death for your faith, not separated from the love of God that is in Christ. Famine. You're one of the minuscule number of Christians in Somalia where it's the highest mortality rate due to hunger. And you're a Christian and you sit there and you watch your child slowly die of hunger. You're not separated from the love of God that is in Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Nakedness. You lose everything. You don't even have clothes on your back. You're a beggar on the street. You're barely hanging on to life by a thread. Not separated by the love of God that is in Christ. Sword. They kill you. So what? What? Your death is your gain, not separated by the love of God that is in Christ. The depths, you're one of the few Christians on the boat that was making its way from the Middle East or Africa to Greece. And in a, in a mass hysteria or something, everyone moves to one side of the boat and the boat goes under. And you fall to the depths of the sea and die to the depths. Not separated from the love of God that is in Christ. That is the promise. That is the key. The cross of Christ. So if it appears here and now that Jesus isn't lifting a finger for you, remember that he lifted his body up on a cross for you. He put his whole body up there so that ultimately you would overcome. The litmus test of God's love for you is not what's happening here. It's what happened to him there, Christian. He is the type of Savior.
that helped you when you needed it the most. You can trust him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You're the best father there is. And your son is the best savior that there could be. And so we ask that you would now send your Holy Spirit. I know he's here and I know he's working. I pray that he would give us faith to believe in the midst of the chaos and the storms, our diseases and our deaths, Lord, that we have a God who loves us. Father, if there's anyone in here who has yet to publicly profess that, to own that, I pray, Jesus, that they would be like the woman and that trembling, you would bring them forth and they would, by faith, declare that man healed me. He's the Messiah. I trust in him. Father, help us as Christians, as followers of yours, that we could still say, while we're going through the midst of the chaos and the disease and the storms and the deaths, that is my Savior. He's going to get me through. Thank you for that hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing our final song with us. benediction this morning comes from 2 John chapter 1 and verse 3. Now may grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and in love. Amen.